Good afternoon again. We're out and about from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. We meet not far from here to Thornwood Terrace at the police station under Barton Road. Turn up the hill and you'll come first to Thornwood Primary School and then we're next door at the crossroads there to Thornwood Terrace and we give you all a warm welcome to come along at 11 a.m. on the Lord's Day Sunday or again on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. and we also meet on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. And we do extend a, a warm welcome to you. We mean that most sincerely. Just come as you are. You don't need to prepare yourself in any sense, but come along and you'll hear the Bible being read and you'll hear a message from the Bible that we trust will be appropriate for the day and generation that we find ourselves living in. We've one or two out and they're handing out gospel tracts and they're handing out uh, calendars for the year. Please feel free to take what's given to you with no obligation whatsoever. We hope obviously that you will read what you receive, but please take these things. One of the tracts we're handing out is called Complete Healing Cure. It's a tract that's been written by someone known to us and it's written in connection with the coronavirus. Well, you know, friends, the coronavirus has affected us now for nearly two years and it has in some sense changed our lives and maybe our lives will never be the same compared to what they were before the virus came along. Now, I'm not able to talk exclusively or informatively about the coronavirus. I'm not a medical man. I really don't know much about these things. I would never pretend that I do. But there's no doubt that many people are fearful because of the coronavirus. As far as I can see, it's only a matter of time before you do get it. It's not if you get it, but you will get it. And many are telling us that the, the vaccinations and the jobs will help if we do get it. Well, these are matters for others to discuss. I wouldn't enter into these things at this moment in time. But it's clear and it's evident to anyone that people are fearful regarding this virus, fearful of getting it and then perhaps fearful of dying of it because this can happen to some people. And there is a great fear of death that's hanging over society at this moment in time, and particularly with this new variant that has come along. Well, friends, there is something else that we should fear above all these things. It is a disease that every single one of us has. It's a disease that we have by nature. It's a deceived disease that we have the moment that we were conceived. And the disease that I'm talking about is called sin. And sin is indeed a deadly disease. A disease that affects the young and the old the educated and the uneducated, the well-off and the poor, those who are being born in Scotland or the UK, or whether you have been born in Zambia or the United States or China or Japan, it makes no difference. We all have this disease. And because of this disease, we are sinners. We have a sinful nature, and that nature reveals itself in sinful acts, and they can be seen day after day. Our prisons are full because of sin. We have wars because of sin. We have family breakdowns 
we have fightings, we have stabbings, we have lying, we have cheating, we have stealing, we have fornication, we have adultery, we have lying, we have all kinds of cheating, all because of this deadly, deadly disease called sin. And what's more, friends, this de disease cannot be addressed by mankind. Mankind can know and feel the effects of it, and we most certainly do. Our courts are full, our prisons are full, our hospitals are full, because ultimately sickness comes because we are sinful. All sickness stems from the fact that mankind is sinful. There would be no sickness in this world if there was no sin. That doesn't mean for one moment that if someone is seriously ill, therefore they must be a seriously bad sinner. No, nothing like that at all. But the very fact that we have sin, we have sickness. And every one of us experiences some kind of sickness. This problem is so great and so universal that mankind itself cannot deal with it. Our politicians cannot deal with it. Those who create jobs, those enterprising people, they cannot deal with it. Our educators who teach in our schools, in our colleges and our universities and who prepare people for the work to come, they cannot deal with it. And the list is extensive and almost endless of people who cannot deal with this problem. But God can and God has. God recognizes the problem. Where did it all come from? Adam and Eve were made perfect. Adam was made out of the ground, out of the dust of the earth. And God breathed his spirit into him and he became a, a living being. And then God made a helpmeet for Adam. Out of his own body he made Eve. And they were our first parents. And they were created holy and pure and upright. And they enjoyed a wonderful relationship with their Heavenly Father. But something came along and changed their relationship. What was it? Well, the evil one, the devil, that one who hates every single one of you, with that total abhorrence and hatred, and he seeks your destruction, that one came along and tempted Eve and said to Eve, you can eat from all the trees in the garden. You see, God had put a prohibition upon Adam. He was able to eat from, from the fruit of all the trees apart from one. He was not allowed to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the devil came along and tempted Eve and said, Eat it, eat the fruit, and you'll become like God. And Eve looked at the fruit and saw it was desirable to her, and she ate it. And she gave some to Adam, and he ate it. And ever since that moment in the history of mankind, away back there almost at the very beginning, a tremendous change came upon the relationship between God and Adam and Eve. They began to hide from God. They no longer loved Him. They no longer served Him. They no longer obeyed Him. What happened? Sin entered into their experience. And because of that, that's why death came. And all kinds of difficulties that we face today, they can all be stemmed back to that point in time when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and ate the forbidden fruit. 
and as the Bible says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. There's Paul's account of what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. Adam was our representative. He was the great head of humanity. When he sinned, we sinned. We were in him and we inherited his sinful nature. For every one of us has come from Adam and Eve. They are our first parents. And when they fell, we fell with them. And that's why we have sin in this world. And that's why we have death and suffering and sickness and violence and robberies and all kinds of crimes. That's why there's wars between nations. It all can be attributed to this act and this deed called sin. And we are affected by it. We're not perfect, nothing like it. And if you're fearing coronavirus, friends, you should fear sin far, far more. Because if sin, if it is not dealt with, will bring about our eternal destruction. But we come out here this afternoon to tell you the good news of the Christian gospel. What is the good news of the Christian gospel? The good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done something about something that we could not do ourselves. He has dealt with the problem of sin. He was punished as a sinner. Although he himself was absolutely sinless, he could not sin, yet he was punished as a sinner in the room and place of sinners. And therefore he took the punishment that was rightly due to mankind there on the cross. You've all heard of the cross. Surely it's, it's essential. It is a, cent a central part of Christianity. You've heard that Christ suffered and died. He was put on a cross. And you may well wonder why. He was there, friends, because he was offering up himself as a sacrifice for sinners. He was satisfying the just demands of God's holy and inflexible law. You see, the wages of sin is death. You might think that sin is not a serious matter. It's a trifling thing maybe to you, but it's not in the sight of God. And sin is offensive to him. And therefore he had to do something about it. And that's what we find in the gospel. The apostle Paul said that he was a great Christian missionary. He was once upon a time a Pharisee. And he once upon a time he hated Christ and hated Christians. But he was converted. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. That was what Christ did, he said. He came into the world to save sinners. He did not come into the world to save righteous people. Why not? Because there are no righteous people. There are no innocent people. There are no righteous people. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all sin because we have a, a sinful nature that manifests itself in sinful actions. An example from everyone's family will help us understand what the preacher is trying to say. If you are a parent, if the Lord has blessed you with children, what a blessing it is to have children. What a gift. That is a gift from God. Your child has come along. 
You look after your child, you feed your child, you care for your child, you love your child. Your child, as it grows up, it becomes selfish. It does things that are wrong. It will lie. It will deny things. It will speak back to the parents. It will be disobedient on occasions. And I ask you, did you teach your children to do these things? The obvious answer is no. You didn't teach them to be disobedient. You didn't teach them to be nasty. You didn't teach them to be jealous. You didn't teach them to steal things or to curse or to swear. You didn't teach them to do these things, but they do them. Why? They do them because they have a sinful nature. Like every single one of us, we have sinful natures. Sin is a real problem. And if I was just to talk about sin, it would be very disappointing. And it would not be encouraging to any one of us. But friends, the Christian gospel, although it tells us that we're fallen and that we need a saviour and that we're sinners, it tells us there is a saviour and it provides a remedy and it's God's remedy. It's a divine remedy. It's a remedy that works. It's a remedy that we can trust. It's a remedy that will, if it's applied to us, will take us to glory. It's a remedy that will take us to heaven. It's a remedy that will cleanse us from all our sins and all our unrighteousness. What is it? It is to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to, to receive Him as our Lord and as our Savior. It is to repent and to believe the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ then is able to save us. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. That's what we find in the Bible. You'll find it in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8, 9, and 10. They're reminding us that if we say that we do not have sin, then we are, in effect, kidding ourselves, and we're not living up to the reality. We're not looking at things as God would have us look at it. In the early world, before God destroyed the world, by a great flood, he looked upon mankind. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was the verdict of the Lord God upon the old world before it was destroyed. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I admit, I acknowledge, that is not a flattering picture for us. We will not get big-headed. But it's an accurate picture. It's God's testimony. It's God's assessment upon our lives. And that is as true today as it was thousands of years ago. You see, the problem, friends, with mankind is the heart. The heart is the problem. Your heart, my heart, the very core, the very center of mankind, this is our problem. And because it is there the problem is it's so great a problem that we cannot deal with it ourselves and because we cannot deal with it we're inclined to dismiss it but that's fatal instead we need to go to the word of god 
and be submissive to what God says to us in his word. And although it doesn't flatter us, yet it tells us for our education and for our betterment. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But, here's the but, a very important but, and we will not hide it. But, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's the wonder of the gospel. Although mankind is a sinner, although he's lost, although he's perishing, although he has no right to grace or mercy in any sense, yet God is offering this to us in the gospel. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You might well be familiar with the, what's been regarded as the the most popular or the most well-known verse in the Bible. What is it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. This is wonderful news. This is great news. At this time of, of the year, most people are out and about and they're maybe looking for a gift for a loved one and they want to express their love to their loved one by buying them a gift. Friends, God has given mankind an unspeakable gift, a priceless gift, and that gift is his son the lord jesus and if we if we will but believe upon him wonderful and glorious spiritual blessings shall be ours like what like the forgiveness of sin would you not like your sins all to be forgiven would you not like in some sense the slate to be wiped clean to have a wonderful relationship with God, the one who made you and formed you, that you would be able to call him Abba Father? How can you have this gift? How can you know this blessing? How can you be reconciled to God? How can you have all that Jesus Christ can give you? You must receive him. You must call upon him. You must seek him while he may be found. That's why we come out. And that's why we seek to bring this message to you. That you would come. And that you would seek him while he may be found. Jesus said on one occasion, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth in me shall never thirst. Now Jesus is not talking about physical hunger or spiritual or physical thirst rather he's talking about a, a spiritual hunger and a spiritual thirst he's talking about filling a gap in our lives that we all have by nature and he's saying he can fill it I am the bread of life bread is is our food we need our bread and food to sustain our physical lives well you need the Lord Jesus to give you spiritual life I am the bread of life he that cometh to me shall never hunger you'll never be dissatisfied if you will but come to the Lord Jesus Christ I'm not going to say for one moment that all your problems shall be over I'm not going to say that you'll no health and wealth and prosperity, far from it. We can never guarantee these things. But if you will but come to the Lord Jesus, confess your sins, take up the cross and follow him, you will have the gift of eternal life. You will be received into God's family and you will know that your sins are forgiven. He that believeth in the Son hath everlasting life. Can you honestly say this afternoon that you believe truly 
on the Son of God? Is he your Lord and is he your Savior? Do you follow him? Well, he says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You know, when you truly believe upon the Lord Jesus, you have everlasting life now. It begins now. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. You'll not see everlasting life if you will reject the Lord Jesus. But the wrath of God abideth on him. He said to the church in Laodicea, yes, he said to a church, would you believe this? He said to a Christian church, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. There was a church who thought they were a Christian church. But the Lord Jesus was telling them, knocking at the outside of the door, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I wonder if we can apply this to you this afternoon. Is it true that in some sense the Lord Jesus is knocking on the heart of your door, your knocking on the door of your heart? Is your conscience being stirred? Do you know something that you're not right with God? Do you know that you're not ready to meet God should you pass from the scene of time today, tonight, tomorrow? Who knows? Life is very short. Life is very uncertain. Life can be very brief. Are you ready for eternity? Where are you going? Again, you don't like to think on this matter you don't like to be reminded about your mortality my mortality this might be the last time I will stand here and preach who knows it could well be into eternity before I know it before you know it where will you go the atheist will say to himself and he will try to comfort himself by saying, well, when I die, it's all over. And he's quite bravado about it at the moment. He's quite fit, he's quite well, and he doesn't have any fear of imminent death. But when death comes, or when it comes nearer, I wonder if he'll be so full of bravado then when he knows the end is about to come, will he not wonder where will he go? We all do. In our quiet times, in our moments of reflection, we all wonder what will happen. The Bible tells us, friends, that when we die, we will go to one of two places. The Christian, the follower of the Lord Jesus, the one who is saved, the one who has his sins forgiven, who has been reconciled to God, he will go to be with Christ. He will enter into heaven, awaiting that day when he shall be resurrected and he shall know the fullness of his salvation. But what about those who reject the Lord Jesus? What about those who are not Christians? Who do not have their sins forgiven? Who have not been reconciled to God? Where will you go? If the Christian goes to heaven, where does the unbeliever go? Friends, the Bible tells us 
that the unbeliever will go to that terrible place called hell. A place that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Many people make laugh and light of hell. They think it's going to be a place where all their friends will be and there'll be great parties and they're going to enjoy themselves. That's a completely and utterly different picture from what we find in the Bible. It's a place of torment. Endless, 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 eternal torment. With a worm, it will not die, we are told. It's like a bottomless pit. Friends, we're out here this afternoon to tell you that that need not be your end. There's another place. It's called heaven. And we need to be prepared for heaven. Heaven's a holy place. A place full of light. A place of peace bliss, happiness, fellowship, communion. And we need to be prepared for it. For by nature, we are not ready for heaven. By nature, heaven would be a hell for us. We need to be made fit for it. That's why we need to be born again. We need to be made like God in order to enjoy the presence of God in heaven. And this is the great change that must come upon us all. We need to be made ready for heaven. Our sins need to be forgiven. We need to be made holy. We need to be made righteous. We need to love the things that God loves in order that we might dwell with God and that's why we need to be changed and that's why Jesus said to someone who was a deeply and devoutly religious man he said to Nicodemus someone who in our modern world would be someone who would teach at a theological seminary and he said to this person, you need to be born again. You need the new birth. You need a new nature. You need to be transformed. You need to be changed. Because as you are, you're not fit, you're not ready for heaven, for the kingdom of heaven. And what's true of Nicodemus is true of us all by nature. We need this transformation. We need this change to come about us. How can this change come? It can only come by the working of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who changes us. He is the one who gives us new life. He is the one who makes us fit and ready for heaven. Do you know this, friends? Ye must be born again. You need to be born again, sir. Your eyes need to be opened. You need to see your lostness. You need to see your hopelessness in of yourself. And you need to turn. You need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to call upon him. That's why he says in the Old Testament in Isaiah, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. And there's no other way to be saved. There's no other way to be right with God. There is no other way to be happy in eternity except ye come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. 
Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him unto our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There's the message of hope in the word of God. Our God is a pardoning God, and the penitent, those who repent and believe, will find mercy in our God. Who is a God like unto thee, it says in the word of God. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He, re he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. No, my dear, I'm not going to shut up. As long as I have a voice, as long as I have a tongue, Ah, that's good. I'm glad you're hearing it. He and your soul shall live. How can they hear unless a preacher comes and preaches to them? Faith cometh by hearing, the Bible says, and hearing by the word of God. That's why we're out. We're here to proclaim in some measure, and it's only a small measure, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you must hear about this person because you're asked to put your faith and hope and trust not just for time but for all eternity upon this person. And how will you dare trust this person if you know nothing about him? That's why we have preachers. That's their duty. Their duty is to take the word of God and to proclaim it and to make it clear, crystal clear to everyone that they might come and believe upon him and that they might know and enjoy the wonderful, glorious, spiritual blessings that are found in Christ. What are these blessings? These blessings are your sins are forgiven. Oh, hallelujah. You might think you go to a priest or you might go to a cardinal or you might go to the Pope himself, but he cannot forgive your sins. No, friends, he cannot, they cannot, they cannot do it. But there is one who can. Who is that? It is Jesus Christ the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Has your sins been taken away then? Have you got a burden? Are you carrying about a burden upon your back as it were? I'm talking figuratively here. But have you got a burden, friend? Have you got something there that's troubling you? Is your conscience troubled? Do you not have a peaceful conscience? And maybe you don't know what it is and you cannot articulate it. But I can tell you what it is because I used to have it. I know what it is. And basically you're not right with God. You don't have a, a right relationship with God. That's your problem. That's why your conscience troubles you. And sometimes it troubles you more than others. But when sickness comes, it troubles you because you're reminded about your mortality or when loved ones go or friends go and they leave this world and you put yourself in their place and you say, if I have gone like him or her, where would I go? Your conscience is troubling you. You have a burden. Well, Jesus says to you in the gospel this afternoon, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is what you long for. You long for rest. You long for that burden to be taken away, to be rolled off your back. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what he says. Find it yourself in 
in Matthew chapter 11, the last three verses of that chapter there, we have what is called a wonderful, full and free and fulsome gospel invitation to the chief of sinners, to the drunkard, to the drug addict, to the alcoholic, to the fornicator, to the adulterer, to the murderer, to the rapist, come. This is what the gospel says. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will deal with your sins. Do you know that the greatest Christian was the Apostle Paul? But do you know that he was a blasphemer? Do you know that he was a murderer? Do you know that he persecuted Christians, women and children? He persecuted them and hated them. But he was converted. And he calls himself the chief of sinners. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. That's what he said of himself. And he was an arch criminal, a heinous sinner. But Jesus saved him. You could go to the thief on the cross. He was more than likely a murderer because the Romans would not crucify someone simply for being a thief. His theft must have been an extremely violent crime. He turned to the Lord Jesus. Moments before he died, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's what he said to Jesus. Remember me, Lord Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, in your kingdom of glory, when you rise again. Remember me. What did Jesus say to him? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That man was forgiven. That man who was a terrible and a notable sinner and who could do nothing for himself because he was pinned to a cross, he was saved. Are you saved? This is the most important question you can ask yourself this afternoon. It's not about your money. It's not about your career. It's not about your festive arrangements. It's not about gifts or anything else. What is the most important question? Are you saved? You can only be saved if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to draw our time to a close. It's been good to be with you again. We hear from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. And we do issue you a warm and sincere welcome to come along to our services. We meet at 2 Thornwood Terrace. That's just off Dumbarton Road, opposite the police station. Turn up the hill. You'll meet Thornwood Primary School first. And we are next door at the crossroads there. Please come along. 11 a.m., on Sunday or 6 p.m. or Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. May the Lord bless his word to you this afternoon.